On The Last Dead Last, we ranked 10 movies from the IMDb Bottom 100. And honestly, most of them weren't that bad, so I figured it, I needed a different opinion. So I went to a similar website called Letterboxd.com, which is just a movie social media site that you can write reviews on and rank movies and blah, blah, blah. And I went to the very bottoms of their list to find all the horror movies I could find. And my criteria was... Uh, the Human Centipede 3, which I consider to be one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my entire life, which on Letterboxd is ranked 1.4. Uh, these movies are all ranked lower than that. So these are 10 movies that are ranked lower than The Human Centipede 3. Why am I doing this? What? Who? Why? What? Why? why? Number 10. Our first movie is the 2007 Asylum Mockbuster AVH Alien vs. Hunter. This was the poster. Not surprisingly, this one was a blatant attempt to cash in on the release of Alien vs. Predator Requiem, which, um, what wasn't much better. The Greatest American Hero is here, and this one is sitting at a 1.3 on Letterboxd, slightly lower than Human Centipede 3, and was directed by Scott Harper, one of only two movies that he directed. The other was Super Croc. There's this crashed spaceship, and it has an alien that starts killing. And, and I have a question, which I guess applies to Alien vs. Predator as well, if they're, on, if they're on Earth, and the Predator is also an alien, isn't it just alien versus another alien? This whole movie has this odd yellow filter placed over it. I'm not sure what kind of look they were going for with that because it's like the equivalent of someone just peeing on the movie. And there's some sort of big spider monster that I guess is what the alien transformed into. And then the hunter shows up for a series of pretty incomprehensible shots. The people in a little mountain town then I guess have to, I guess, walk down the mountain to get away because they don't want to take cars for some reason. Like they say not to drive because it attacked a car earlier. So they think they shouldn't drive. So they walk, but get attacked anyway. So why not take the chances with the cars? Dee Dee Pfeiffer is in this too and they alien and hunter fight and whatever you want to call this because you can't see a damn thing and i see why people hate this one it's basically just walking through the woods the movie wait wait guys where's mr garrison i mean that name is basically ruined the alien is either small enough to fit through a sewer or big enough to flip a car depending upon what they need because oh yeah not only is there plenty of walking through the woods there's a bunch of walking through the sewers this one's just remarkably dull without a single new or interesting thing to offer, but on the plus side, at least it has some cool practical monster suits going on, which is probably the only positive thing I can think of to say about it, except for maybe that it's better than the Human Centipede 3. But then again, look at this lazy disintegration effect. <laughs> Number nine. Next up is a classic with 1964's The Creeping Terror, which also sits at a 1.3 and starts with a good shot of the creature, which I guess is sort of a slug-like thing, but basically just looks like a bride in a too long wedding dress of sludge. If you like narration, then this is the film for you, since it contains a narrator that gives us such important details like... They looked at the rocket in utter amazement. Thank you uh, for telling me that. I'm not sure that I could interpret what that look on their faces was. Apparently this is because a lot of the sound was improperly recorded and lost, so instead of paying to have the voices overdubbed, they simply added a basic narration over all those scenes. The monster attacks, um, like, like this, and here's the story with this ridiculous monster. They hired a special effects artist to create a creature, but when they didn't pay him for his work, he took back the suit one day before filming began. So, director Vic Savage had to ask his crew to whip together something, and they tried to make it look similar to the original, ending up with this, uh, rug monster. It attacks a dance hall, and holy crap, this movie is painfully dull. The worst part about this is that there's barely anything funny about it. I mean, 
the monster is pretty silly looking and when it eats people i mean yeah that's fairly goofy because it always just like it's just their legs getting pulled in but it's not really that funny and honestly it's just not fun this one has earned its reputation for being terrible and after finishing the film just prior to it being released facing down a bunch of lawsuits and a possible fraud indictment savage straight up vanished and was never heard from again it's reported that he passed away in 1975 from liver failure but even that is unconfirmed uh, regardless though it's certainly certainly more watchable than human centipede 3. <laughs> number eight and now i can't believe i'm doing this myself once again but it's roller gator i know i've made fun of roller gator before but i've never covered it and i and i swore i would never watch it again but whatever uh fine this is about the torture i, I guess uh, somehow this is at a 1.3 here and that's the biggest shock of all because there's no way in hell that this should be over a one star ever. So what is Roller Gator? Well, uh, it's another one of those classic Donald G. Jackson films created of the Roller Blade 7 and I don't quite think it's an official one of his Zen films but it kind of feels like it. Uh, his Zen films were ones that he shot without a script. He would just take actors out to a location and film them to see what happens. Like taking Joe Estevez to an actual carnival and having him walk around pretending to talk to people like he owns it. So, I should break it down for you because when there's bad movies, I put things in three categories. The first are those that are just inept. Someone made a movie but didn't really know how, and you end up with a weird mess of things that ironically ends up being enjoyable most of the time, but for the wrong reasons. The second category are those that are boring, like Alien vs. Hunter. These ones are usually not fun to watch, and I generally hate sitting through these because it's not even fun bad. But the third category is the worst offender, and those are the ones that are just frustrating. Like, you just don't understand how this came into being. Like, who thought that this was a good idea? And it's usually coming from someone who knows better. This falls under that category. It's so frustrating and annoying that you don't get what's going on. What's this about? Well, this girl finds this little talking alligator that's a, a bit of an asshole. What are you doing here? What does it look like I'm doing? The electric boogaloo? I'm hiding! That's what I'm doing! Who are you hiding from? From people who ask me a bunch of stupid questions. That's who! And there's also a ninja after him who's being totally stealthy by wearing that suit at the beach. I mean, who would notice this ninja just skulking around? Why is this so frustrating? Well, just listen to the sound quality. Yeah, yeah. Well, you keep taking those hot dogs, stick them in your forehead, back them like you're a Martian. You're not going to charge anything after a while. Hey, come on, Uncle. The chicks think that. <sighs> yeah, whatever. The worst part is that I think this was intended to be a family film, like Jackson's attempt to do his own kid-friendly line like Full Moon with Prehysteria or something, but I tried showing this to my kid, and she asked if we could watch Requiem for a Dream instead because she said she thought it was more kid-friendly. That's a true story. Maybe not. This movie is so hard to watch that people made pins and patches that proclaim, I survived Roller Gator. The only good thing that I can say here is that this film is number eight, which only means that anything after this will seem way more tolerable because even though I don't hate it as much as Human Centipede 3, I uh, hate Roller Gator. Number seven. For our number seven movie, we again go back to 1965 with Monster A Go Go, which was directed by Bill Rabane, who I recently discussed with the movie Blood Harvest, but apparently H.G. Lewis was also involved, because I guess here's what happened. While filming the movie, Rabane ran out of money and was unable to finish it. Lewis was looking for another movie to put with one of his as a double feature, so he just bought the film, shot a handful of scenes, and released it. 
It starts with an astronaut returning to Earth in a crash and vanishing, leaving behind a wife and little Jimmy here. And then it kind of just jumps around a bunch, introducing like six or seven random characters. And then there's a giant crusty-faced monster attacking people. So there were several years in between filming and the reshoots, so some of the actors weren't able to come back. And this guy here, who is the same guy as this guy here, drastically changed his look. So to explain it, they simply state that he's the other character's brother. And much like The Creeping Terror, this one's biggest fault is just being dull. Prepare yourself for lots of footage of people sitting, or, or sometimes standing, while having conversations about n not much at all. Just basically restating the plot over and over to each other. And then, in case you're not sure what's going on, there's a narrator who once again just plainly tells you what's happening. City streets were cleared of all but official personnel, with the realization that even seeing the monster might mean that an individual was close enough to absorb a lethal dose of radioactivity. Here's an interesting tidbit though, the monster is played by Henry Height, who was seven foot six in real life, and yeah, I think there's a story here. It's, it's pretty much just a random assortment of characters and scenes thrown together. It's, it's kind of hard to say that this is one of the worst movies ever made because it never feels like a movie. I often see the word disjointed used in reviews of it, but I'm not sure that there's any joints at all, like, like Kansas. That being said, this movie sits at a 1.2 on Letterboxd, which means that people think less favorably about it than freaking Roller Gator and Human Centipede 3, which I'm going to go on to say, no, not quite. The ending of this movie is probably the most frustrating thing about it since it wraps up with the police chasing the monster into a sewer system and then that's it. There's no fight, no nothing, they just don't find him there. And then they get a telegram that the astronaut is safe uh, somewhere else. So like the creature might have been an alien taking his form temporarily and then just vanishing. Number six. This is where things get really spicy here because we go now to 2019's Verotica by Glenn Danzig, and it's a movie based on short stories from the Rockers comic book series of the same name. If you haven't seen this one before, let me tell you, it's, well, an experience. The first short, uh, The Albino Spider of Dajet, has a prostitute who has eyeballs for nipples. Your teeth, they're looking at me. For some reason, uh, this spider in her house turns into this thing that starts killing people. This one is set in France, so everyone has a French accent. So what did Glenn do? Hired American actors and asked them to fake it, which makes everyone sound so natural. The police are calling this murderer May I suggest that one go straight home? For so somewhere out there is the neckbreaker. It's pretty clear right from the get go that Danzig has the same skills with directing as he does in fist fights. <laughs> the spider thing can only come out when Dajet is asleep and she commits suicide and then the spider is shot. I don't know why the spider appeared, or why she has eye boobs, or anything, or why he thought it would be a good idea to ask everyone to use these accents. I don't know. The second film is called Change of Face, and it's about a killer taking women's faces, and she's also a dancer, and being protruded by a jerky cop, and she murders obviously real people who react in extremely real ways. I'm in here. I didn't call maintenance today. To get your face. My face. No. And then it literally just ends. Like, the cop confronts her, but she gets away, and then just goes to dance uh, somewhere else. But then we have our third story. Uh, Jukija, whatever, Countess of Blood which I think is supposed to be a take on Lady Bathory, 
but has no real story. It's just our villain killing women and bathing in their blood. No story, just that. Um, so here's the thing. When this came out, it was hailed as an oh-so-terrible horror movie version of The Room. Basically, it, it's so bad that it's hilarious. And that might be true for some of it. I definitely laughed pretty hard for a portion of the first segment, but then it just dragged on and on. And isn't that interesting or, or even funny? It's just kind of a depressing example of someone who doesn't understand the first thing about filmmaking being allowed to make a movie. Based on this movie, I'm not even sure that Danzig knows the first thing about basic human communication with how he seems to think that people talk. After the first half hour or so, it just becomes depressing and, and pointless. And at a 1.2 rating, it deserves it. This isn't quite as unwatchable as Roller Gator and definitely not as frustrating and annoying as Human Centipede 3. But it's close, really close. Number five. It's getting worse here since we're dropping down to the 1.1s with 2015's American Poltergeist, a movie that was released to capitalize on the remake of Poltergeist as if that was something that people were into. Like no one cared about that, let alone a knockoff of it. It's put out by ITN, which is just not, not, not a good sign. And a bunch of college kids move into an old house and wait a minute, well, at 325 a month, including utilities, I mean, who cares? Did he say 375 a month? $375 a month for that house. Where where is that? I will go there. I will fight ghosts. I do not care. This lady is here and she was one of the Amityville witches and this house is even fully furnished. It it has a pool. Five kids move in, so they're all living there for 75 bucks a month. Did like Lucille Bluth write this? The kid the kids move into a big mansion. I mean, what could it cost? $10? So the film is supposed to take place in Massachusetts, but was obviously filmed somewhere else because they just took all the license plates off the car because I guess it would ruin the illusion to have like California plates on the car if they're in mass. And yeah, big old blank spots on the backs of the car are way less noticeable. All of the acting in this one is like, you, you know those viral videos that are going around where there's text on the screen and then there's this computer voice that reads that text? It's all kind of like that. There's spooky mannequins around that disappear. And I hope you like bad dialogue spoken in robotic manners with subpar audio recording because that's the vast majority of this one. Something starts happening to some of them, which pretty much just means they twitch some. And it's, I guess, Lizzie Borden's house. And this girl is her descendant. And we're 45 minutes into this thing and nothing has happened. Everyone has just kind of walked around the house and stuff. Taryn decides to leave and hilariously tries her car one freaking time and decides it won't start. But oh no, none of the cars start. So I guess she's trapped there. She can't drive away in a car, so she just has to stay at the house that she's afraid of. Can't just, I don't know, call a cab or Uber or whatever. Can't just like walk down the street. There's nothing keeping her there. Like, like some friends come by later and she could very easily just say, oh, hey, you drove here. Give me a ride real quick. At around an hour, things start to happen, but it's just this. <laughs> oh no, blonde lady is running. How scary. And look, I'm not gonna tell you that this isn't a bad movie. It is, it's terrible. It's boring, not scary, and difficult to sit through. But to put this at a 1.1 worse than all the other movies that I've already talked about? No, no way. This movie might deserve to be on this list, but not at number five. Maybe, maybe number nine or something, but not five. <laughs> number four. Coming up next is another ITN film. Yay. And it's the Ouija Experiment 2 Theater of Death. And there's th three of these now, so I guess maybe a timeline is in order at some point. I've not seen the first one, so I can't judge that. And, and I guess this is also called the Ouija Resur Resurrection. So here's the deal. It looks like the first movie was just that here, a film. And there was a screening of it, and these people went to it, and yeah, in this universe, all of these people went to the theater to go see the Ouija experiment, which, okay, sure. 
These guys win a contest where they get to spend the, the night with the cast and crew of the movie, and they have an actual Luigi board from the first movie and decide to try it out. But, oh no, they don't say goodbye, which is one of the rules, and the board comes to life. And, um, uh, fo focus, you, you just, you, you want to just focus that? You see, you see the, the planchette is on a word, but uh, I, I can't see that word because you didn't do the basic step of focusing your camera. Seriously, this is an insert shot. No actors required. How difficult would this have been to reshoot once you saw it wasn't clear? And hey guys, remember Exorcist 3? What if we just did that whole hallway shot thing? Like, exactly like that. But then just make sure that it's not nearly as effective. There's then a spirit thing attacking and this guy has camera glasses and you know, it's legitimately maddening that this movie is so low of a ranking on here. Uh, this is just a typical bad movie. The whole point of this was to see things that would be considered the worst movies ever made. And this is fine, it's bad and all, but is it really that bad? Things happen. They're, they're not done very well, but they do happen. The acting's not great, but it's certainly not terrible. I didn't wonder out loud how someone could possibly arrive at that possible line reading. It, it's not visually appealing, but it's not shot in a stupefyingly confusing manner. The storyline has a through line and at least has some semblance of sense. D don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to prove that this is a good movie, or even a decent one. It's bad, but we're supposed to be talking about the worst movies ever. The movies that so many people ranked with half star or one star that no one at all got anything from it. The fact that this is lower than Je Jesus, even American Poltergeist is insulting. I, I even think Alien vs. Hunter is worse than this. Come on, Letterboxd users, you're, you're letting me down here. I was braced for bone splitting awful and you're just giving me basic bad. Number three. Okay, let's see how crappy we can get by dropping down to a score of 1.0 with 2019's The Haunting of Sharon Tate. And I'm kind of curious about this one considering it has a 2.8 on IMDb, which is higher than most of the other films on this list on that site, but it's way lower here. It also has a 19% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes and was directed by Daniel Ferrans, who also directed The Amityville Murders and a movie about Eileen Warnos, so he's into making movies about real life murders. It stars Lizzie McGuire as Sharon Tate and then gives us some real news footage from the actual murders. And Sharon is staying in Beverly Hills, very pregnant with the child of Roman Polanski. And she's with friends, all of which look like they just stepped out of the cast of Arrow or something. And it follows the accounts of her last couple of days, including encounters with Charlie and his family, and then throws in some schlock horror elements like a sort of Ouija board and finding her dead dog and weird messages and Charlie's recordings and yeah it's easy to see why this is so hated but it's not really so much about the film quality there's nothing about the film that is really done well but it's also not exceptionally poor it's shot well the acting is um fine Everyone is painfully miscast and Duff has nowhere near the depth that this role would require to do justice to. But it's not like they're terrible actors, but it, it, it's a movie that you just kind of feel dirty watching. It's a weird exploitation slasher film that's a recreation of a real life set of killings. Almost every review for this one uses the word tasteless and that, that's about right. It just turns into a sort of home invasion torture porn flick that feels gross because you know what the outcome is. But you don't because I think that this is where the whole tasteless factor of this film comes into play because I'm going to talk about the ending here and things don't go the way that you would expect. Similar to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, here Tate and her friends get the upper hand and kill their attackers. Although. This actually came out before that one. But yeah, everyone survives and they kill Charlie's family. But as Sharon goes back up to the house, oh no, they are all there dead, including her. So they didn't turn the tide. The whole thing was a ghost dream or something. And that one dream she had of everyone dying 
was real and everything after that was a dream. And yeah, I, I see why people hate this one. It's cheap and gross and takes a real life horrible situation and tries to turn it into a shock schlock flick. But is it hard to watch? Not really. It's fine, boring, lifelessly directed. But with this one, it's more the subject matter that makes it terrible and it's hard to argue with that. But yeah, I'm just not gonna get over the fact that like that this movie is so poorly revered for being tasteless for fictionalizing and dramatizing Sharon Tate's murder and those same critics like lauded Once Upon a Time in Hollywood for doing uh, the same thing. <laughs> number two, getting down to the wire now and number two is the movie that for a while was IMDb's lowest ranked movie and it's 2012's Jurassic Shark, which sits at 1.0 on Letterboxd. This was directed by Brett Kelly, who I've covered a few times now. He did Avenging Force, Raiders of the Lost Shark, and Ouija Shark, all movies that I covered in other episodes on the channel. This has a scientist getting a grant and doing a professional fist pump like scientists do right in front of CEOs. And they're by a lake and doing some oil digging, but they dig too deep. Two girls go into the lake. Uh, lake, I said, because I don't know why, but all these backyard shark movies seem to take place in a lake, and they do that thing that every girl does in the water, splash each other repeatedly. Even though they're not far from shore, they both get pulled under the water, so keep in mind that this movie's supposed to be about a megalodon, a giant shark, and yet this lake is deep enough for it to, I guess, be all the way submerged and pull these girls under without being seen. So it has to be coming up from underneath. How deep is this lake? There's some art thieves that stole a painting that they're transporting in a hatchback and then a rowboat as art thieves do, and they're knocked in the water. Something just brushed past my leg. Hey guys, a 70 foot shark doesn't brush past anything. It's 70 feet long. And yeah, um, a 70 foot shark doesn't just like grab your leg for a second. You're like a damn chicken nugget to them. It, it would just, it just eats you. We finally get to see it and look how big this thing is. And also let me point out that this guy is standing up and the water's to his hips. Earlier, when standing next to his friends, he's shorter than they are. This guy's like 5'8 or something. Water up to his hips is probably like three foot deep at the most. So how is this shark in the, the same freaking water fully submerged? I wish it were funny, but it's just, it's just kind of dumb. The thieves want to retrieve the painting after losing it in the lake and team up with a bunch of teens to walk in the forest for a really long time. Uh, they then go to the science lab, but they're cut off from land. And again, they're on a lake. I, I guess this is an island on a lake. And that's where they put a research facility. And I, I love that the scientific researcher under his lab coat is wearing crappy jeans and a hog's back t-shirt. And he's shown to be in water up to his knees and then gets chomped. This is just really really dumb. It's a magic shark that knows to destroy all boats to strand people in this lake and is alternatively huge and tiny at the same time. And I mean, just look at this thrilling fight scene. Again, how does this shark fit here? And yeah, this is what we're talking about when we talk about bad movies. Bad acting, lousy cinematography, crap logic, goofy effects, boredom, and just bad filmmaking like this. Look out! What? Tia! Tia, the gun! It doesn't matter. You silly girls. You wasted all your bullets on a goddamn fish? Um, she never shot. Did you forget to film her shooting her gun? But honestly, it's a movie for like a hundred bucks and it's a coherent ABC plot. Honestly, I'd watch this uh, 100 times before watching Human Centipede 3 again. 
Uh, maybe my tolerance for schlock is just higher, but I'm not frustrated or annoyed or anything watching this. So much that, whatever, I'm gonna watch its sequel, Jurassic Shark 2 Aquapocalypse. Which, oh no, was not directed by Brett Kelly and was done by Mark Polonia instead, and starts with this really convincing T-Rex versus shark battle. And this stock footage that I'm positive that he used in other shark movies, and it's a direct sequel as the drilling company is back on the lake and just monitoring the shark so they can continue drilling because, you know, it's easy to hide a megalodon uh, in a lake. All of Polonia regulars are here, intercut with obvious stock footage. Although the captain says there's lots of sharks in the water uh, there, which is just weird for a lake. But then they show an ocean shore. And, and yeah, this, this is what I watch for. Bad, low-budget movies that know what they are and are just a blast. They, they say the thieves rented their boat a few days ago, so this is just a few days after the first movie instead of the nine years that it actually passed. And yep, it's the exact stock footage sequence Polonius used before. And you know, IMDb says the budget on this movie is approximately $100,000, but I'm just gonna assume that they accidentally added two, possibly three zeros on there, and I love it. Look, look, ocean, lake. This is a fun treat after sitting through the dull garbage on most of this list. Um, fun garbage. It hits a slow part in the middle that you kind of zone out for, but yeah, if you're down with Polonia, uh, you, you know what to expect. <laughs> Number one. Finally, here we go. The worst ranked movie on this list. The lowest ranked horror movie on Letterboxd coming in at a .8. Didn't even get a one star average. The only movie to get below one star, and it's called uh, Kartoffelsalat, which is German for potato salad. And this is a German film that starts with the hilarious warning that it's based on a true salad and that ingredients have been changed, which is a pretty good indication that it'll be a horror comedy and a sign of what type of comedy it'll be. A terrible one. It's a zombie invasion and oh, get it? There's a, a skateboarding zombie and one doing handstands, and now there's chickens. Get it? It's a joke. Get it? We bounce back one week, and there's more humor as this student gets a bad grade, so he kills himself, which is just so funny. I don't know how to process the emotion, and I, I don't know, maybe there's a cultural things that just don't translate because this whole scene is reliant upon kids passing a note that just says penis, and the kids then are compelled to just say penis out loud, and Leo gets in trouble for doing it. I guess it, I guess it might be funny in Germany, and I, I don't know. I, I, I just don't like. Like the principal says, Leo's no good, and his mom pulls out a piece of Swiss cheese and says it's no Gouda. I mean, Gouda has holes but not like this. This is clearly Swiss cheese. And come on, Germans know cheese. So what does this joke mean? That, that this random piece of cheese isn't Gouda? And, and it happens just after the principal says no good and good and Gouda sound similar? How does this correlate? I'm nine minutes into this movie and not only am I questioning continuing this channel, I'm questioning whether people should be allowed to continue making films. Leo starts a new school and I'm telling you, every scene is just jammed with what may be jokes, but I can't tell. Like, the secretary is drinking through this big straw from a fishbowl? Is this a gag? What's the context? I don't know! The teacher has the words, my ass, painted on his desk. Is that a joke? Is it just funny because, you know, my ass is, is, am I, am I gonna make it through this? There's a spring dance that everyone attends, and oh, there's a boxing match going on. Is that a joke? Uh, is it like, wouldn't it be strange if there was a boxing match in the middle of a school dance? Because, you know, you wouldn't normally see one there because it's a school dance. Get it? I, I don't, actually. The students start coming down with a sickness that makes them cough up blue, and they all become zombies, so they have to fight them, and oh look, it's a video game fight bar. That's a fresh and new joke that you haven't seen before, 
right? At least it's a joke I understand. So the virus was in some spiked punch, so only those that didn't drink it are unaffected, except stupid people. So the virus makes you stupid. If you are already stupid, you don't become a zombie, like Leo. And yeah, guys, this is it. This is frustrating, annoying, unfunny, unscary, shoddily made, but still professional like, I guess. It's clear that money was involved here, but money foolishly spent, and every single aspect about it fails, and not, not in a fun way. I think ultimately I would rather watch Roller Gator, and I just want you to understand how strong of a statement that is. I hate this movie and everything about it, and look, the military is going into action to stop the zombies, but there's two karate guys in the back doing karate. Is that also a joke? Uh, there's no way of knowing. I guess if you're a diehard, and I mean d diehard Bloodhound Gang fan, you'll want to watch this to see the cameo of uh, evil Jared Hasselhoff as nauseous zombie number one. But that should be the only, um, and I do mean only, like solitary reason in, in the world to watch this. It even tries to throw a twist ending at you and for some reason has several characters who happen to look like Breaking Bad characters and it deserves its spot as the number one movie on this list. The question is, would I rather watch this than Human Centipede 3? I do not know and I am not prepared to think about it. The question is just, It's just too big. So there you have it, 10 movies that are ranked lower than Human Centipede 3 on Letterboxd and are theoretically the worst movies of all time, which I uh, am not feeling. Uh, honestly, there's only f maybe three movies on this list that I would qualify as being like gut-wrenchingly awful and hard to watch. Most of them are just boring and like meh, meh. Yeah, that's just typical bad. Um, but yeah, there's some really uh, terrible junk in here. Roller Gator will always be one of the hardest movies ever to watch. Um, and now, Potato Salad will be up there as uh, just wholly frustrating film going experiences. I just, I don't, I can't even quantify that. But I don't know, there you go. If you've seen these, if you hate these more than me, if you think I'm silly for saying that these aren't, most of these aren't that bad, uh, let me know down below in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, let me know that as well too. Uh, hit the like button, hit subscribe, share this video out to your friends, put it out there on the internet, whatever you wanna do, totally cool. Um, also, if you get a chance, check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines. These guys go there and they're pretty awesome. They're my patrons, thank you guys. And I wanna thank you guys for watching this video and I will see you very shortly for another great video. Thanks a lot, and bye-bye.